Welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Heidi Coltfarber for an informative webinar on how to confidently read and interpret CBCT scans. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section and we will answer them live at the end of the webinar. CE is not available for this webinar, live or in demand. Dr. Colt Farber, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. I will pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shirley. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Henry Shine for sponsoring this. Um, today, we're talking about how to read and interpret CBCT scans. And I want to thank each of you for spending your evening with me. A few disclosures. Um, I am the founder and managing oral maxillofacial radiologist for dental radiology diagnostics and DRDX doctors. Um, I am also a 3D trainer and key opinion leader for multiple of the imaging companies, and I'm adjunct professor at UNC Chapel Hill School of Dentistry and assistant professor for general diagnostic radiology at Loma Linda University School of Medicine. All right. And then these are our objectives. So there was quite a lot of objectives um, that I was sent. So we're gonna just kind of work through these. One of the biggest things is reviewing a CBCT scan and looking at the basic anatomy. We also wanna talk uh, some about um, guidelines for reviewing our CBCTs. What do we need to do legally, ethically? What are the latest regulations for 3D imaging? And then I just wanted to show some cases because I think it's much more fun when you get to review cases together. So we're gonna go over a TMJ case, airway space case, um, endodontic lesions, that sort of thing. And of course, a lot of it's going to just be live reviewing CBCTs with me. So hopefully you will enjoy and have a ton of fun. Um, just really some quick things, and I know there are other lectures in which we've really talked about fundamentals of interpretation, but I just wanted to review quickly some of um, our principles for interpretation. So uh, radiologic interpretation, of course, we know is the ability to see and understand what is revealed by a radiographic image or our CBCT volume. Uh, we do know based on research that we have done that there is a learning curve to that. I'm sure that you have found that in your office as well. In fact, um, usually takes you know a couple, a couple of years to really be able to hone in your skills and know exactly what it is you're seeing with all those gray values. So if you're struggling a little bit with it in the beginning, it's okay, it's completely normal. Um, we found that when we looked at some of our endodontic residents, first, second, and third year, while the first year endodontic residents found statistically significantly more lesions in the 3D, they were less confident in what it was that they were seeing. And of course, by the time they were second and third year, not only did they see statistically significantly more lesions in 3D, but they were more confident in it. And so your confidence will definitely grow over time. Uh, here's some keys to a successful interpretation. First of all, we have to have a diagnostic CBCT. And what do we mean by that? We really want to make sure that um, we have taken it at the proper exposure setting for the patient so that we are able to see the details we need to see. It is possible with some of our CBCTs for them to be underexposed. And if they're underexposed, we see a lot of noise in our image and it can block the details or make it difficult for us to see the specific details we're interested in seeing. Um, the other thing is we need to make sure that there are no motion artifacts in the CBCT. And that has got to be a number one, is no motion artifacts. If there's motion artifacts, obviously um, we're not gonna be able to see the details that we wanna see. And, you know, looking at, for instance, for endo, looking at the periodontal ligament spaces and that sort of thing is going to be really difficult. If you're doing measurements for implant treatment planning, your measurements will be off if there's motion. If you're sending it out for a surgical guide, the surgical guide may not fit. Um, proper viewing conditions. We do tend to live in a dark room, so come on over to the dark side. You know, sit back with a nice uh, cup of tea, some lovely music, and reviews your CBCTs. 
um, understanding of normal anatomy. We have done uh, lectures in the past on normal anatomy. So if you'd like to brush up on that, go find those lectures. I am gonna go over CBCT with you today and I will point out all of the anatomy, but if you really want to hone in on those skills, you probably wanna go find the lecture we already did that just specifically talked about anatomy. Have a knowledge of head and neck pathology. And it's not that different 2D versus 3D. So if it looks like a cyst in 2D, it's gonna look like a cyst in 3D as well. And then have a systematic approach to reviewing your CBCT. And we're gonna talk about that today. So with our systematic approach, we want to look at our entire patient. We wanna gather our patient information. We wanna have a systematic search pattern just like you do with your panoramics or your intraoral imaging, we want to have that uh, systematic search pattern. So we go from more of a global to a local evaluation. And we'll talk about that later on. We wanna describe anything that we find. Um, we use our radiographic signs to do that. Um, we write things up looking at those radiographic signs and we'll go over what those are as well. And that helps us when we're trying to figure out what category of disease to put a particular entity in. So proper viewing sequence, look at things globally. Many times when we take a CBCT, we are interested in one specific area. It is easy for us to go to that one specific area and forget to look at the entire volume, but the entire volume needs to be evaluated. And so because of that, I'm gonna show you how to go through looking at everything globally first, and then we can look at things more locally. Um, globally, we tend to go through things in the axial and coronal sections. Um, we can compare uh, different sides, so you can look at symmetry. Uh, what we wanna look at, of course, is figuring out if your image is diagnostic. We wanna look at the symmetry of form and density evaluate the cortical boundaries. We really can differentiate the soft tissues with our CBCTs. And so we do spend a lot of time looking at those cortical boundaries because if the cortical boundaries are not there, it could tell us that there's a pathology going on. Uh, of course, we can count teeth, um, whatever, you know, we can look at everything um, as far as um, the um, dentition is involved, but we can really see the dentition a lot better in those sagittal sections. And so we look at things more locally in those sagittal sections. And that's where we can look at the periodontal ligament space, the lamina dura, evaluate any sort of form and canal structure, or assess crowns for abnormalities. Um, so we do like the sagittal for that, but remember with the sagittal, you really can't see the other side. So you can't use symmetry. And for that reason, it's easier to use that axial and coronal section when we're looking at more of a global approach. Right. So when we're looking at those interpretation principles. Um, we have the importance of recognizing our normal anatomy, our independence of radiographic signs to imaging modalities, principle of symmetry, then looking at those radiographic signs and we do have lectures that we have done in the past just discussing the terminology and description for various pathologies. So if you're really interested in that, you know, any of these could be an entire lecture unto themselves. This is kind of a brief overview and then we're gonna jump into cases today. And of course that categorization of disease or abnormalities and that's really important in helping us decide what it is that we think that we're looking at. So number one, recognizing our normal anatomy. We wanna have that mental image of our normal anatomy when we're going through our CBCTs. It can help us to determine what it is that we're seeing. If we're actually seeing true pathology, or maybe we're just seeing a variation of normal. Uh, for example, sinuses. Sinuses are one of the things that are not symmetrical. In fact, they tend to be asymmetrical. That's kind of the rule of sinuses. So when we're going through our CBCTs, if you see some asymmetry in the sinuses, we wanna know that that is normal anatomy for that patient. Right. The, um, looking at the various modalities, we do have the independence of our radiographic signs. In other words, regardless of whatever imaging modality you're looking at, 
your radiographic signs of diseases remain essentially the same. So for example, if it looks like a cyst in 2D, as I said, it's gonna look like a cyst in 3D. Uh, you know, a cyst is very hydrostatic, it's well-defined, it's corticated, it's radiolucent or hypodense when we're talking about it in terms of CBCT. It's gonna look exactly the same. Principle of symmetry is huge. And when you're just starting out, this is extremely helpful. You can always compare one side to the other. I can say this side looks very similar to that side. So I know that it's normal. So in case you cannot remember all of your anatomy from way back when in your dental school days, we want to reorient the patient. We'll talk about that a little bit as well so that we can use symmetry. You wanna have a symmetrical patient in our scan and that way we can go down through and use symmetry very nicely in those axial as well as in our coronal sections. So here's an example of using symmetry. Um, this particular software, the patient's nose is up. Now some software will have the nose down, but I'll always uh, mention which way it is. So the patient's nose is up. So here's our anterior mandible. And you can see when we're just looking at those cortical borders, oh, that looks a little bit different on that side, doesn't it? Um, in fact, in our coronal sections, again, looks a little bit different. Now we do have some large lingual tori, but it almost looks like something is pushing in on that bone, but the cortical borders are still intact. This is actually an anterior staphne bone defect. But even if we did not remember that from our dental school days, not a problem. You would notice, okay, something looks different. I'm not sure what it is. I think there's something going on and you can easily refer that out to our own maxofacial radiologist. So we've spotted that there is something that is not normal with this patient. Here's another one. Again, I can use um, symmetry to compare. In this particular software, the patient's nose is down. And again, it's just how you reorient the slices. Um, we, we still have our right side and our left side. Don't worry, radiology is still flipped like normal. Um, in any case, uh, we can see that okay, we have expansion of the uh, cortical borders on this side, and yeah, it looks very different than the other side. And when I'm looking at it in my coronal sections, yeah, definitely there's expansion and remodeling the cortical borders. We have kind of a mixed density entity. We have displacement of the tooth, and it definitely looks different than the opposite side. So even if we don't know what that is, we know, okay, something is not right. And I want to go ahead and send that on. I want to refer that on to be evaluated by oral maxofacial radiology. Right. So again, um, radiographic signs help us when we are evaluating something and it helps us to categorize our disease. So we can say, okay, well, this is, you know, well-defined, it's corticated, um, if it's well-defined, we know that it's slow growing. The body's had time to wall that off. And we have this little white line, that's our cortical border. And so again, letting us know it's slow growing. Um, but we know based on our radiographic signs, what it is that we're looking at. So just like we have signs when we're interpreting how to drive, hopefully they're a whole lot easier than this, um, we have signs to interpret our radiographs. Um, now, sometimes there's a lot of different conflicting signs and it can be confusing. So we're gonna work on, um, work on that a little bit today. And sometimes the signs are very unusual. This is thou shalt not park here. So we, um, the kids were playing a band concert at a church. And so they had this little funny sign. I thought that was fantastic. Sometimes the signs are very atypical. I never seen a raptor crossing, although at this particular school I did. Um, so we're going to try to avoid being lost, confused, and bewildered. So what are the radiographic signs that we have? Well, we're going to look at radiographic density, marginal characteristics, shape, location and distribution, size, internal architecture, and effect on surrounding tissues. This is what we look at when we're evaluating something for potential pathology. Um, the two that are underlined are the most important. They tell us how aggressive a particular entity is. Now, again, we have done an entire lecture just on this. 
So if you're interested in delving more into the different pathologies, please go and find that. All right, but when we're categorizing diseases, the very first thing we have to decide is, are we looking at something that is normal or something that is abnormal? And sometimes that's the hardest determination to make. And that's where knowing your normal anatomy is very, very helpful. Um, in fact, you know, when I first went back to school, I was a general dentist for six years, and then I went back to school and took radiology. And, you know, the first time I looked at my CBCT, I thought I saw pathology everywhere. And the chief resident at the time said, well, you know, Heidi, if you think that you see something, what do you think that it is? And that's a very simple statement. But, you know, if you think that it can fit into a category, then you may have a pathology. But if it's really not something that fits into a category, could be you're just looking at a variation of normal. So the very first determination is normal versus abnormal. If you're looking at that going, oh, that just does not look normal to me. This looks very, very different. And um, when I'm looking at symmetry, it looks very different from one side to another. I think this might be a pathology. Well, let's look at some really common things. So first of all, could it be something that's developmental or congenital? Does the patient have a history of it? Does it fit into our developmental or congenital anomalies? You're saying, no, really just does not. It could be something that's acquired such as trauma and inflammation. And these are things that we as dentists tend to be really, really good at. Um, there are some other more exotic things. Could it be a cyst? It could be. Does it look well-defined, corticated, hydrostatic? Um, what about a fibro-osseous entity? Well, remember our fibro-osseous entities, we have a ground glass appearance to them. They're going to be mixed density. Sometimes we see a radiolucent rim letting us know that we have a fibrous capsule or a soft tissue capsule. And many times there's multiple of these entities throughout the jaws. So if you see multiple lesions throughout the jaws, we have to start thinking about a fibro-osseous entity. Um, or it could be something that is a benign versus malignant tumor. And again, with all of these, we have gone through and done lectures. Um, so this is just kind of a quick review for these. Uh, the most, um, I think the most complicated one is probably systemic or metabolic. So if it's none of these up here, kind of a last resort is systemic or metabolic. And the key with this is you're gonna see a generalized appearance throughout the maxilla, the mandible, the cervical spine, or whatever bone it is that you have in your field of view. And then we're gonna to come to an impression as far as what we think this is. Now, one of the things we can do as we're going down through our CBCT is we should be documenting our what we're seeing as we go down through. So. You know, this is kind of a quick example of what we might document. Um, now, of course, you're probably already working on it in your patient's chart, which is great. So you may not need to put down some of this, but you will put, want to put down, you know, the date of the exam, the reason for exam. This is your justification right here for moving from 2D to 3D. So put the reason. Why did I take the CBCT? Um, what is some history that I'm kind of concerned about with this CBCT? Um, now, of course, this might already be automatically within your um, template, and this is probably going to be whatever machine that you have, whatever field of view that you've taken. And, you know, if you're looking at it for implant planning purposes, you could put down your analysis and then what you see in each of the different areas. What do I see in the maxilla or the mandible? Was there something in the airway space? Did we have a limited airway space? And of course, that's going to open us up to a whole bunch more questions with Mrs. Jones. Now, I do need to put our little caveat in here. We're not diagno diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea off of a CBCT. But we could say there looks like there's a limited airway space or, you know, perhaps we have something within the airway space, such as enlarged tonsils and that sort of thing. Um, next, we can look at our sinuses. Do we have mucosal thickening in the sinus? And then we'll want to look at each of the individual teeth as well. So is there something going on? Is it odontogenic in origin? What about the temporal mandibular joints? How do those look? And then we can have an other section. And this is where we can put soft tissue calcifications or thinning, anything abnormal you might see 
within the cervical spine. And so looking at it, you know, in sections can be very helpful for us. All right, so a little bit on our 3D selection criteria really has the same guiding principles as 2D. We need to be able to justify it. We need to be able to say why we moved into our 3D imaging. And it can be, you know, very, very simple. Um, optimization, where you want to use, you know, the smallest field of view needed for the task we're interested in. Dose limitation, we want to decrease the dose for that patient if possible. So let's talk a little bit about our radiation protection. This is exactly what you learned in dental school. Um, we want to be able to use a dose as low as reasonably achievable for that patient. But take into consideration that we can actually be too low with some of our CDCTs. And so we, we really want to make sure it's kind of a LADA. So we're kind of moving from a LARA to a LADA as low as diagnostically acceptable. Um, like I said, it is possible to be too low to get a very noisy image. And so we want to make sure that we are taking an image that is diagnostically acceptable for that patient. We want to take it at the appropriate exposure setting. So that means if, for example, you have, you know, a large adult that you take it at the large adult setting. Of course, if you have, you know, a child and we want definitely want to use the pediatric dose on a child. So with our dose optimization, very patient specific scans. You know, your patients don't need to have the exact same scan for all your patients. We want to tailor it for that patient. And with that, many times, you know, um, you know, we might take a panoramic first, or we might take, you know, the intraoral bite wings first, or the intraoral imaging. And if something looks abnormal, then we can move into our 3D. So, you know, patient-specific scans, uh, use the appropriate exposure setting for the size of the patient. You know, don't be afraid to use the large adult setting for a large adult. Um, limit the field of view to your region of interest that can help to decrease the dose for that patient. And use personal protective devices when you are able to do so, but only when you're able to do so. So what does that mean? Thyroid collar is probably not going to be something that you can use for a CBCT because you're going to get that thyroid collar within the field of view. We're gonna see extensive amount of beam hardening artifacts, and it's gonna decrease the diagnostic quality of the scan. It's gonna make it very difficult for you to see anything. So if the patient is insistent that they must have a thyroid collar for a cone beam CT, then this is probably not the imaging modality for them because a thyroid collar will show up in your CBCT. It will, um, render that volume completely non-diagnostic. What happens at this point? Well, at this point, you need to retake the entire image without the thyroid collar, which results in overall more dose to the patient than if we had just taken it correctly the first time. So just keep that in mind. We don't want to get the thyroid collar in it. We don't want to get the corner of the lead apron in it. It's going to completely ruin your image. And so if you know, we're moving to 3D for a particular reason, we should be committed to move to 3D. Right. There is something called Image Gently. There's the Image Gently campaign, and this is for pediatrics. Um, if you are not aware of this, I would definitely Google this and go to the website. You can make, take the pledge to follow the Image Gently guidelines, and then you can put their logo on your website, it lets your patients know that you're a very cognizant of dose, you're being very, very careful, especially with the pediatric population. We know that they have a much um, longer lifespan, and so we're much more concerned about dose and accumulation of dose over time in the pediatric population. Now, there are very um, low-dose units, and there are low-dose protocols, and of course, there's pediatric protocols as well. But just remember, you know, one size does not fit all. A child is much smaller than an adult. And so when you're imaging them, there's going to be a much larger amount of tissue that is within that field of view that is being ionized. So we're very careful with the pediatric population. 
um, and again, we want to make it specific to those patients' needs. So, you know, if we're talking about 2D imaging, we select the x-rays that they may need, um, not merely as routine, but for their individual needs. If they're high caries risk or moderate caries risk or low caries risk, and always using the passage image receptor. But when you're moving into 3D, um, we want to make sure that we are using a pediatric dose. And that's something that we can control. We may not be able to um, collimate the beam as small as we would like, depending on what machine you have, although some are variable fields of view and you can do a smaller, uh, smaller field of view. Um, again, always use thyroid colors as long as it's not within the field of view. And with the child, it could be within the field of view. So you may not be able to use that with a comb beam CT. Um, so when we're imaging, we want to make sure that we're imaging the as gently as we can for a child. So these are some of our image gently recommendations for pediatrics. This was put out by Ludlow et al. And it's saying CBCT dose can be significantly reduced by increasing the voxel size. So we may not need that high resolution image that we have for an adult. Um, we might be okay with instead of you know a 0.1 millimeter voxel size, maybe we'll go with 0.4 because we're looking typically with kids, we're looking at things, um, getting more of an overall view of what's happening with them and trying to figure out you know where teeth are coming in and how are they erupting and that sort of thing. So many times you don't need the detail that you might need with somebody that's older. Um, reducing the field of view, very helpful as we talked about. I'm um, using that child exposure setting that has um, reduction in all of our um, radiographic settings and follow, following guidelines for CBCT use in orthodontics. So again, Sometimes we're taking these images on children for orthodontic purposes, and there are guidelines for that. So we can base that on the difficulty of that orthodontic case. If it's a mild case, the CBCT is not likely to be beneficial. You can still chew your pan and lateral stuff. If it's moderate, CBCT may be beneficial, depending. And if it's severe, well, then CBCT is considered beneficial, especially when we have complicated skeletal discrepancies. And so using some of these guidelines can help us remembering that not every patient needs to be treated exactly the same way. This can be tailored to each of our patients. So really it comes down to your individual judgment. Uh, we know that we are juggling our radiation exposure costs to maybe an inadequate or delayed diagnosis. So there's, there's a lot of pressures that are on us in the dental field. We've got you know, professional pressures, the pressures from the patient, economic, and then medical legal pressures as well. So many times, you know, if something does go wrong and we don't have the CBCT, that can be an issue and we know that. So we have to think is about you know, what is the probability that the outcome of this CBCT examination will affect the overall management of the patient's dental treatment. So I know we're always thinking about these things. So when do you use 3D? Well, it's very simple. It's when 2D does not give you enough information. We need to move on to our 3D. All right, who's responsible for reading the CBCT scan? Well, we are. When we take it, we are responsible for it, just like we are for taking a pan or lateral ceph. And actually the anatomy we see in our CBCTs, we have always been able to see, and we've always been responsible for, although we didn't really think about it that way. Um, if you look at a pan, you can technically see everything that we can see in our CBCT. It's much more difficult to see it though in a uh, superimposed 2D image. It's much easier to see it in our CBCTs. So ethical and legal responsibilities, we kind of talked about this a little bit, the entire scan vol volume should be examined. We want to be able to recognize abnormal and uh, refer appropriately. There is free training that's offered by many of the manufacturers. So you want to make sure that you um, check that out. And if there's free training, please go. We know that only 60% of the dentists actually go through the free training that's offered by their manufacturers. And technically you've you know, already kind of paid for it, it's included in the price. So please take advantage of it. This is definitely new technology. 
Um, and anytime we purchase any type of new technology, we want to learn about it. We want to know about it and we want to understand it. And of course, there's always oral maxillofacial radiologists like myself that are more than willing to help. All right, so when we're looking at anatomy, we want to be able to recognize the appearance of normal structures in our CBCT image. We're going to use that systematic approach to review it every single time. So you'll see I review my scans the same way every single time so I don't miss anything. Very similar to how you evaluate a panoramic or full mouth series. Um, and then, of course, the entire volumetric uh, data set we want to make sure is evaluated. So let's go ahead and look at some cases. All right. So we're going to first look at a CBCT for anatomy purposes. Um, this is a large field of view. Okay. And this um, was actually a young adult who had been in an accident. And he had gone to the ER shortly after. Um, but a week or two later, he's still having issues with being able to bite down. So as we're looking through, let's see if we can figure out what is going on. Now, the first thing, of course, we look at in this particular software, the patient's nose is up. Um, this software is multi, basically multi-planar reconstructed images. So if, for example, you have a Cydexis unit or a, a Serona unit and you have Cydexis, you're gonna go to your MPR radiology tab. Uh, many times in almost all of the software that's out there for CBCTs, um, the images will first open with a, um, panoramic view. So we can definitely see that. Let's see if I can, um, if I'll be able to move, the, oh, there we go. Make sure we see all of our buttons up here on the top. And I have a bunch of my screen sharing up top. So there we go, we can see everything now. Um, so if it opens up into the automatically into the panoramic viewpoint or the panoramic tab, you always wanna find the MPR or radiology tab or the multiplanar reconstructed images, you want to see all of your gray images. Um, this particular software, we can see a 3D volume or we can do a custom section and we're gonna do a custom section for today, but that can kind of help us when we're going through and we're not quite sure what we're looking at. Um, I go through three passes in my axial my coronal and my sagittal sections. So we're gonna see that as we go down through. Um, sometimes I'm just gonna admit, I'm a little bit lazy and I grab the crosshairs over in my sagittal section and I pull them down through my axial. So if you see me over here and you see this moving, I'm actually looking over here in my axial section. So I don't wanna confuse anybody with that. Um, try to scroll as much as possible, but if we wanna speed things up a little bit, I'll probably grab those crosshairs and move down just so you know. All right, so when we're starting, I always start my axial sections. I start at the most anterior and superior aspect. And this is looking at my sinuses. So I'm gonna go down through the anterior part of the patient, then I'm gonna go up through the airway, and I'm gonna go back down through the cervical spine. And that's how I evaluate all of my patients in the axial sections every single time. When we go to the coronal sections, I again start at the most anterior and superior aspect, looking again at my sinuses. So when I go through in my coronal sections, I'm gonna go through from front to back, looking at basically this superior one third of that patient. So go all the way back. And then once I get to the cervical spine, I'm gonna go from the posterior to the anterior, looking at the mandible. And then I'll make one, um, trip back just looking at my maxillary dentition. So just kind of looking at that midpoint of the patient. And then we're going to do the sagittal sections as well, which I always start on the right side at the right condyle. I go all the way across to the left condyle looking at the mandible. And I go from my left side to my right side looking at the maxilla. And then we'll look at some midline structures. So let's go ahead and review that. 
So we are looking in the axial section and I am looking at my frontal sinuses. I wanna make sure that everything looks pretty good. Um, another thing, caveat real quick, this patient does not have any motion artifacts. How do I know? I can look in my sagittal sections and I don't see any double cortical borders in the anterior mandible or the cervical spine. I don't see any motion within the airway space. So the patient's not in the process of swallowing. And the other thing is we always wanna make sure our patient is oriented correctly, which this patient does happen to be. Some of our other ones later on that we're gonna look at are not oriented um, correctly. And so we'll reorient those patients. So, all right, so going down through, looking at my frontal sinuses, as I move through, I see my ethmoidal air cells, I'm gonna have my sphenoid sinus opening up. And if you're coming down through going, oh, what is that? I'm not sure exactly what that is. Take the crosshairs and look in all three planes. And you'll be able to see, oh yeah, I'm just looking at a pneumatized sphenoid sinus. So being able to use our crosshairs is very, very beneficial if you have any questions at all. all right, going back down through, I'm looking at uh, my nasal septum. I can look at my maxillary sinuses. I want to make sure those cortical borders are nice and smooth and intact. What happens if they're not? What if I have thickening and sclerosis of these cortical borders? Well, lets me know that we probably have a chronic inflammatory process, like a chronic sinusitis or rhinosinusitis for that patient. Uh, this patient, we do see a little bit of a deviated nasal septum, so a left deviated nasal septum. We can look at that. We know that that may decrease the airflow on the affected side. Of course, we can always zoom in and look at things a little bit more closely if we would like. Okay, let's continue on down. And we're gonna look at our maxilla. And we're gonna look at our cortical borders and make sure those are nice and smooth and intact. Again, if you don't see cortical borders, it could tell us that we have a pathology. We really can't differentiate the soft tissues very well with CBCT, but we're really good at seeing the hard tissues. So we can go down through. We could take a peek at our dentition in our axial sections as well. All right, once I've gone down through my um, maxilla, I'm gonna hop back up real quick. I'm just gonna grab my condyles. So just hop back up, we're gonna, we're gonna go down through the mandible, but I wanna catch it right up at the top. And we can look at the condyles. And now I'm gonna go down through using symmetry to help evaluate the mandible. So it looks very similar on both sides. The cortical borders look smooth and intact. And I'm just looking at this mandible. I'm not looking at anything else. And I know sometimes it can be very overwhelming when you have a very large CBCT. That's why we're breaking it up into small sections. So I'm just looking at my mandible. I'm not looking at anything else. Of course, we can see the cortical borders. We can see our mandibular dentition and we're gonna go all the way down through and we're gonna come up the airway space. So of course, this is our hyoid bone right here. This is our epiglottis. We know when we have the hyoid bone that we're at the C3, C4 level. And this tends to be the level that we see a lot of calcifications in the neck. Um, if we're looking lateral and superior um, to the airway space, you know, we might see calcified clotted atheromas. Um, now, actually, we can use this hyoid bone to help us determine what we're looking at. If that calcification is lateral and um, I guess, uh, lateral to the airway space as well as lateral to the hyoid bone, then we know that we probably have a vascular calcification and we'll see it rimming around that artery. If it is medial and inferior to that hyoid bone, most likely this is gonna be um, a normal physiological calcification like our calcified tritetial or thyroid cartilage. All right, um, another area that we tend to look is just anterior to the epiglottis. This is our little vollecular space. And this is where squamous cell carcinomas like to hide out. So if we see gross asymmetry in this area, we want to let that patient know about it. We want to ask them if they have um, a persistent sore throat, difficulty swallowing. We probably want to send that on to ENT for further evaluation. Okay. Um, but caveat again, make sure they're not in the process of swallowing because you could just be looking at the um, 
lingual uh, tonsils as well as they're, as they're swallowing. So let's go ahead and move on up. And again, you know, we're looking um, for any sort of calcification, but we're really not seeing anything. This is a young, otherwise healthy patient. Uh, moving all the way up to the nasopharyngeal region. Um, and the nasopharynx, again, it should be fairly symmetrical. Um, we do see this little outcropping of soft tissue. This is the torus tuberius. Anterior to that is the drainage of the eustachian tube through the sinus of Morgagni, which is just plain fun to say. Um, posterior to that, we have the fossa of Rosenmuller, which this is a very special little area. It's kind of a little dangerous space. This is where our nasopharyngeal carcinomas like to hang out. And so again, if you see gross asymmetry up in this area, we're gonna ask the patient additional questions. Um, many times, of course, we're up in the nasopharynx, we are just um, posterior to that nasal fossa. So the patient's gonna have a feeling of congestion. Um, they may have some bloody noses. They may have um, you know, difficulty swallowing and that sort of thing. And of course, if we don't know what it is. We're gonna to want to send them on for additional imaging. So you'd send them to ENT. All right, and as we move on up, we can see some of our other anatomy as well. So we have our um, intracranial um, carotid artery canals. We can see the external auditory canal. We can see our mastoid air cells. And of course here we can see our little ear bones within the uh, middle ear. I'm gonna see our semicircular canals, um, internal auditory canal and go ahead and all the way up. And many times we see this little calcification. He likes to hang out right along the midline. And that's our calcified pineal gland, which is a normal physiological calcification um, that most of your patients are going to have. And again, if you ever have any questions, you can always send this to an oral maxillofacial radiologist to evaluate. All right, now we're up at the top again. We're gonna come back down, just looking at the posterior aspect of that scan. And we're going to look again, um, making sure our cortical borders are nice and smooth and intact. We're gonna head down through foramen magnum. We're gonna look at our cervical spine. We have the arch of C1. We have the little odontoid process of C2. Odont, because it looks like a tooth. Really everything does go back to dentistry. Just so you know, it's all about the dentistry. Um, and then we'll go down through our cervical spine. We've got a transverse foramen right here. We know that our spinal cord is within our vertebral foramen as we go down through and making sure that everything looks fairly symmetrical. And we can have a little bit of variation between one side to the other, but, um, and of course it also depends on how that patient's oriented or whether they're rotated within your scanner as well. All right, so once I finish all the way go, um, going down through the cervical spine, I'm going to look at my coronal sections. So I typically move the crosshairs anterior. Again, I said I start at the anterior and superior aspect. And we're gonna start from, again, front to back, as I said, looking at the frontal sinus, the nasal fossa, we can see our maxillary sinuses, our orbits. And I'm really looking at maybe this top half of the scan. Um, we see we have a little bit of conchabulosa right there. That's just a pneumatization of that metal turbinate. Um, I can see the ostium or the opening of that maxillary sinus and drainage. And you can see how large the sinus is. We do have pneumatization of that maxillary sinuses, which of course we know is normal. And moving back, through, we're going to move into our sphenoid bone, making sure everything looks pretty good. We have our medial and our lateral pterygoid plates. Um, we can see a lot of our foramina as well. So the sphenoid bone is just a beautiful bone. Um, we can see, for instance, foramen rotundum. We've got a little vidian canal down here. Of course, our optic canal goes through in this region. And we're going to be able to see our little carotid canals um, as actually they're, they're coming up, although kind of looks like they're headed down, but they're really on their way up, All right? We can see our semicircular canals, middle ear with the ear bones, the external auditory canal. Uh, we can see our mastoid air cells and the mastoid process and all the way back as far as your scan goes. We wanna make sure we evaluate the entire volume 
um, because we can see pathologies all the way back. Now I'm going to go from the most posterior to anterior aspect. And I pick up here looking at the cervical spine, making sure that looks nice and intact. Of course, we can see actually our jugular foramen right here. And you'll notice there's some asymmetry with that, and that is normal. So um, we usually have the, um, which I think usually the right side is bigger than the left side. So this patient's a little bit backwards, but that's okay. We don't hold that against him. Um, we've got our styloid process as well. And I'm gonna pick up looking at my condyle. So I can look at my temporomandibular joint. I can look at the um, glenoid fossa region. I can look at my condylar heads. I can make sure that the cortical borders are nice and smooth and intact. And moving anteriorly, again, I'm just comparing bilaterally, looking at those cortical borders, making sure they're smooth and intact. Um, we can look at the teeth as well. This patient has a little dense bone island right here. Um, nothing really to worry about. Moving all the way forward. And then I'm gonna make a quick pass back from the anterior um, to the posterior aspect of the maxillary dentition. I'm just looking at the dentition, making sure everything looks nice. We can look at periodontal ligament spaces and that sort of thing. And when I hit my sphenoid bone, I know I'm done because we've already done that part. All right. Let's look at our sagittal sections real quick. And again, remember sagittal, I can't see the other side. So I can't compare it for symmetry, but this is really good for looking at um, my individual teeth, having that more localized approach. I usually enlarge it. I can see the um, condylar head very nice. I can see the temporal mandibular joint. Let me move this down just a little bit too. So, okay. You can see that glenoid fossa region, that looks pretty good. We don't have any osteophytes. Um, Cumbler head looks pretty good, but there is a little secret here. We do have a fracture. So remember the patient was having issues with biting. So we do have a subcondylar fracture, fracture of the condylar neck. Um, so definitely can see that going on. And we can look at that in all three planes. And we can zoom in and take a peek, but that is why this poor patient is having some issues. I can turn off the um, crosshairs there and look at it. And we can see, yes, we do have a fracture. So you can see it going all the way through as we move down in our case, right there. All right, so we're gonna continue on because we know the patient can have as many diseases as he pleases and there can be a lot more going on. So we're gonna continue looking at everything. And of course, if you see fracture on one side, we always wanna look at the other side and make sure that that looks, um, that we don't have some sort of fracture going on. We can always adjust our brightness and contrast if we want to be able to look at things just a little bit better. And I'll zoom in. Again, we can see that periodontal ligament space is really, really nicely. Um, we do have, um, resorption of some uh, primary retained roots and going all the way across. Of course, we can look at our cortical borders as well, making sure that's nice and smooth and intact. And we'll follow that over all the way over to the other side. I didn't see any additional fractures with this one. Again, we can look at the temporal mandibular joint on this side, making sure that everything looks nice and intact. Now, one of the things you need to know is that these cortical borders of the um, mandibular condyle are not fully ossified until the individual is between 21 to 22 years of age. So this is a younger patient than that. And so you might say, oh, I don't really see those cortical borders as well as I would like. Um, actually, it doesn't mean that this patient's having any sort of issue. It just means that they are younger and the cortical borders are not fully ossified. So we can't see them in our volume. All right, and we're gonna go from the um, left side maxilla all the way across to the right side. Okay, and then I make one quick pass back. I'm gonna look at my uh, um, tergomaxillary fissure palatine fossa area. We can look at the cervical spine. We can see cella tersica up here. This is where the pituitary gland is. Um, kind of a 
fun little fact or a question here. How big should this be? Well, it's about the size of a dime or less. So the size of a dime is about 17.9 millimeters. And so if it's larger than that, we might have an issue and we'd need to send that patient on for additional imaging. Of course, we can look at our incisive canal and that sort of thing. Um, and then going on over to the left, uh, pterygomaxillary fissure, pterygopalatine fossa, making sure those cortical borders are smooth and intact. And then we are done. So it's taking me a little while to sit and talk about it as we went through, but you actually can go through this very, very quickly. So let's hop on and see some other volumes. So let's look at uh, some temporal mandibular joints and see if we have any sort of an issue. It's just a little bit to load. Um, now with this particular case, I do have to share, this patient is in a supine unit, so they're laying down. And so when you're looking at the sinuses, you'll notice that, wow, that looks very odd. Uh, it's because the patient has um, some very fluid secretions. We've got some nice bubbles within the sinuses and it's because they're laying on their back. So that's where we have this appearance. Um, if we're looking at the sinuses, you'll notice that the uh, cortical borders are smooth and intact. Again, we have the air bubbles letting us know we have active secretions. So we have an acute or allergic rhinosinusitis. But that's not here we're here to see. We're going to take a quick look at the temporal mandibular joints. And actually, let's continue with how we would go through it. We'd go through it looking at the right side first. And if we're looking at that, we can see a couple of things. So first of all, we do have an anterior osteophyte. So that bird beak pattern there lets us know we have some bony apposition. We have something that looks like a hyperdensity anterior to it. And this is our osteophyte that has broken off and is floating in the synovial fluid. So we would call that uh, joint mice. If it's one, is it a joint mouse? Well, that's a good question. Um, they're called joint mice. So um, definitely we have um, something like that going on and we have thickening and sclerosis of the cortical borders within the glenoid fossa region. So let's just know we have a chronic inflammatory process on that right side. Um, let's go ahead and look at the left side. And same thing, we have huge osteophytes. So you can see how the osteophyte on the other side, how if this would have broken off, it's floating in the synovial fluid, it would look very much like what we have on the other side. Um, so huge anterior osteophyte. And again, we have the thickening and sclerosis of the cortical borders within the glenoid fossa region. Um, so we know we have a chronic inflammatory process. Now, the other thing I'm gonna take a quick peek at here What's the patient's bite like? And it looks like we are actually in crossbite, but they are biting all the way down. So if they're biting all the way down, we can go ahead and look at um, our interarticular space. And the interarticular space, well, a little bit interesting because the condyles are placed slightly anteriorly. Um, and it, while it looks like it's fairly normal, it does look like the osteophyte is in um, fairly intimate proximity to uh, the articular eminence. And so patient may not be able to bite down correctly. And we would wonder where exactly is the soft tissues located? So when we're looking at this, um, we say, yes, it looks like we have you know, fairly severe um, temporal mandibular joint disorder or um, osteoarthritic changes. So we'll say severe osteoarthritic changes. And we might want to refer this patient on um, for additional imaging. Uh, we want an MRI to be able to look at the soft tissues and figure out where that disc is actually located. Uh, this patient also has an interesting, and I'm going to optimize it now for the teeth. So we've got a, a root canal treated tooth. And we do have an apical hypodensity. So 
a couple of things we're going to look at when we are considering an endodontically treated tooth. We can go ahead and do a custom section and we're just going to slowly look through that. I want to make sure that everything looks fairly good. The periodontal ligament spaces look like they are intact. Um, and then I go through my axial sections, making sure we didn't miss a canal. So when we're going through these axial sections, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any unfilled uh, canal. The other thing we want to look at, do we have any sort of asymmetric bone loss to this patient? You have some very, a very large post in that distal um, root canal. Might have something going on here, maybe um, vacation involvement. So now when we're looking at root canal treated teeth, there is a lot of beam hardening artifacts. So that can make it difficult for us. But what we're seeing down at the apex looks like we have an enlarged marrow space or a fibrous healing defect. Um, so I would say the majority of CB or of um, root canal treated teeth, we might see a fibrous healing defect or slight widening of the apical periodontal ligament space. It doesn't always mean that this is a non-healing root canal treated tooth or a failed root canal treatment. Um, it could just mean that we have a fibrous healing defect. Um, so we want to go off of the symptoms of that patient. So just know that you know if we if we see something at the apex of a root canal treated tooth, it doesn't always mean that it is non-healing. In fact, oftentimes we see something at the apex of a root canal treated tooth. And then we're trying to figure out, well, is this fibrous healing defect or is it non-healing? We don't see anything else going on with that patient. The patient has no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, many times we can see um, a fine internal trabecular pattern, which we kind of can here as well. And so we would say most likely this is a fibrous healing defect in an asymptomatic patient but we would want to check out um, what's going on with the buccal furcation region and make sure we don't have any sort of a perforation or anything like that. It's real thin um, remaining uh, tooth structure there. All right, so let's move along for the sake of time. Let's look at our airway space really quickly as well. And again, we are not, telling the patient that they have um, obstructive sleep apnea based on this. We are just looking at um, whether the airway space is limited, whether there's any sort of obstruction and that sort of thing. And that's going to lead us to additional, um, I guess, questions for Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones really needs to go on for sleep study to be properly diagnosed. So uh, this particular patient, we can already see um, couple of things. We do have motion artifacts as patients in the process of swallowing. Is that going to affect our measurement for the airway space? Absolutely it is. Um, but we can see some other things as well. We have an enlarged adenoid tonsillar tissues as we're coming down through. We really do have some really enlarged palatine ten, um, tonsils. So there are um, definitely some reasons that we'd be concerned about this airway space. And of course, these are our lingual tonsils right here and those look enlarged also. So it could be the patient has some sort of a viral or bacterial infection, um, you know, slight enlargement of the tonsillar tissues within a young adult is considered normal, but when it gets to be exuberant, obviously they're gonna have difficulty with um, being able to breathe properly. So many of our software will go ahead and it'll automatically segment this. Um, this particular software, we can kind of threshold back and forth because we do see lots of different CBCTs and we need to be able to do that because um, all of our CBCTs are a little bit different in their brightness and contrast and that sort of thing. So. With this one, we can kind of um, toggle things back and forth. And we can see that our minimum cross-sectional area is 14.2 millimeters squared. Um, that is very limited. 
So typically, if it's 100 millimeters square or less, we'll go ahead and say it's limited. Um, if it's about 100 to 150, we'll say it's on the small side of normal. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to look at this in our 3D. So I'll go ahead and look at it with our 3D volume. And we're not probably going to see a lot because it's a pretty dark color um, because there's really not, not a big airway space. Um, but we can do our best here and say, okay, well, the minimum cross-sectional area for this patient is about you know, five millimeters in the AP dimension and only three in the medial lateral dimension. That's because he has those really large tonsils and we are swallowing, so you gotta remember that. Um, so we know this isn't exactly the airway space that we have um, for this patient, but it gives us some sort of an idea and it opens us up for additional questions. You know, Mrs. Jones, it does look like you have you know, quite a limited airway space. We have an enlarged tonsils. I'd like to go ahead and refer you on for a sleep study. Maybe I wanna refer you to ENT to go have the tonsils removed and that sort of thing. Um, so definitely we can um, let Mrs. Jones know what's going on. So there is talking about our airway space. Um, let's see. Our time is technically up. Um, I'd love to show you a couple more cases. Uh, let's see something really quickly, just because you can't have more fun than radiology. And I know you really have nothing better to do on your evening. No, I know you do. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll go through this kind of quickly, but I just wanted to show you some other things. And it's always fun to be able to show cases and, and share various things. So uh, this patient came in and you could see um, the dentition is very worn down with this particular patient. Uh, we are missing teeth as well. But the question was, do we have a fracture on tooth number eight. And so, you know, we don't always see the fracture lines, um, especially if it's a very fine fracture, it has to be displaced larger than the resolution of our machine. Um, but we can sometimes see them. So as we're going down through, we see, all right, number eight, we do have some sort of a linear radiolucency or linear hypodensity, because a lot of times we talk about this in terms of density, but it could be beam hardening artifacts as well. So how do I know? Well, if I see it in more than one section, I'm much more likely to say, yeah, we definitely have it going on. But on top of that, we have evidence within the bone. So the bone tells us what's happening as well. And we can definitely see we have a large apical lesion. We have um, asymmetry. So kind of a J-shape uh, radiolucency or hypodensity and really goes pretty much to the termination of that line. Let me see if I can, I'm gonna make it a little, optimize, let's see if we can make it um, more high contrast for us so we can see a little bit better. There we go. So you can see, yes, we do have some fracture lines here. And I'll turn the crosshairs off so we can see it a little bit better, but we can definitely see we've got the fracture line there. We can see a fracture line here we can also see a little bit of a step defect and you can see it correlates with our area of bone loss. And we can actually see some fracture lines in our sagittal sections as well. Now these kind of move as we go through, you're gonna see it moving here. It looks a little like it extends a little bit beyond, um, looks more like a vertical root fracture, but we definitely have some fracture lines going on. So we can see, um, our fracture lines with our CBCT. I just always like to make sure that it is in, it's visualized in multiple sections. And we have the um, bone that um, kind of corroborates that fact for us. So again, when we're going through our sagittal sections, we can see it's right here. It correlates with that region of bone loss. It lets us know, yes, we do have a vertical root fracture. And you can even see a little bit of that step defect as well. In fact, here in this section, you can see that fracture line as it moves down through. All right. So I wish I had more time to spend with you this evening. Um, it's always fun to sit and look at cases. We definitely need to do this again. Um, we have more cases that we can play with. With that, I just wanna thank you so much for spending a little bit of your evening with me.
hopefully you learned something and had fun. And I know I did. Um, is there any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Colt Farber. This definitely was a very interesting presentation. We are now open for questions. Please go ahead and type it into the Q&A um, box and I will be reviewing them and giving and passing them along to Dr. Colt Farber. And we do have some, Doctor. Um, the first one we had is from Dr. Chen. Is there a minimum age for a pediatric patient who can have a CBCT? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, there really is not. If you if you see a pathology based on the 2D imaging that you want to learn more about, uh, then going to a 3D uh, CBCT with a pediatric setting is um, still something that we can do. And many of the units have low dose settings, not just pediatric settings, but low dose settings. And so I know that some of the units, um, you can have a, um, like a, a quick CBCT that's about three microsieverts for their ultra low dose settings. Well, when we're comparing that with other things, a set of bite wings is five microsieverts. So many of our machines coming out now, they're very cognizant of dose. Not only do they have the pediatric dose for when you wanna see a little bit better detail, but if you just want kind of a general review of what's happening, um, some of them have that ultra low dose um, CBCT, which could be less than a set of bite wings. And so those are things to consider when we are looking at that patient's 2D, saying, oh, it looks like we have a lesion there. Um, you know, if we think there's a lesion there, definitely justification for jumping into 3D to try to be able to better understand and better plan what it is that we're seeing. You know, we wanna make sure that we're, we're not just seeing a variation of normal that doesn't need to go on um, to, you know, see maybe um, an oral surgeon or maybe it doesn't maybe need a biopsy or something like that. So I would say if you see something, especially in a child that looks very concerning, then move into one of either the ultra low dose or the pediatric setting. And of course, again, you can take a pediatric setting with a limited field of view too. So there's lots of different options. Um, we go more off of what the lesion is that you're seeing or what it looks like in the 2D imaging. So again, you just have to be able to justify moving in. Now, of course, the kid may not sit still. So if we're looking at you know maybe three and four year old, obviously they are not going to sit still is it worth moving into CBCT or, you know, at that point, should you send them on for additional imaging in, um, you know, another regard? So sometimes when we send them to our oral surgeons, they can send them on for something like an MRI, um, which just so you know, dental MRIs may be coming down the line. So that'll be exciting for us in our offices. Um, but, you know, if it's a really big lesion, they may need additional more comprehensive imaging than a CBCT, so. Thank you, doctor. And this next comment is from Dr. Colton, who wanted to express uh, gratitude. Thank you very much. And Dr. Colton, we will be sending out the live recording over the coming week. So you will be receiving that if you've registered. Um, thank you for that. This next question comes from Dr. Backer. What was the name of the fibrous defect at the end of the root canal? A fibrous healing defect. So sometimes what we see is that the root canal treatment has, you know, essentially done its job, um, but the bone takes time to remodel. And so, you know, the, the lesion that was at the apex isn't going to go away overnight. It does take time for that bone to remodel. And of course, it follows the normal healing process where you get, you know, a a fibrotic defect first, and then that slowly will start to ossify um, and remodel throughout time. Um, now, sometimes we see that it kind of stays looking a little bit more hypodense or less dense than the surrounding bone. And so we'll just say, well, we have a fibrous healing defect with that. So it just follows the normal healing process that everything else in our body does. Um, and it takes a little bit longer for us to see that within the bone than what we saw was 2D imaging. You know, with 2D imaging, of course, you had superimposition of your cortical borders. And so if we looked at it in 2D, we thought, great, it's all, it's all healed. It looks great. 
Um, with CBCT being able to see between those cortical borders, we can see it takes a little bit longer to heal. Um, now, again, we do go off of the symptoms of that patient as well. If they continue to have symptoms, then we're going to categorize it as non-healing. But if they're completely asymptomatic, your periodontal probings are normal, your um, periodontal ligament space looks normal, essentially, except for the little apical hypodensity, i say it's a fibrous healing defect. So. Thank you, doctor. And uh, another question coming from Dr. Chen, uh, sorry, from Dr. Another comment coming from Dr. McCarthy. More of this, please. You are a great speaker. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I had a blast with this. I think this is um, one of the first times we've done this format, but I think seminar style format is so much fun. So I agree. More of this. I agree. Very informative. Um, and this next co question comes from Dr. Naik. Is there a good dental radiology textbook to use as a reference? Yes, there is a good one. Um, I think it's um, Principles of Interpretation, um, Oral and Maxillofacial, or I think it's Principles of Interpretation. It's one that we learned in school, or the one that we looked at in school. I think when I went to school, it was by White and Farrow um, for Stu White from UCLA and Michael Farrow from Toronto. Uh, but it's Principles of Interpretation, um, or I mean, it's Principles of Interpretation, Oral Radiology. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, but it's uh, been updated by their predecessors. And so now I think the um, predecessors are Dr. Ernie Lamb from Toronto and Dr. Malia from UCLA. So I think it now says Lamb and Malia. Um, but it's a fantastic book. It's really been updated with a lot of the CDCT stuff. And it follows all of the um, principles that we talked about and all of the radiographic signs and it's something that we're all taught as we go through school. It's a great one to have in the back of your office. You know, if you're doing, um, if you see something on the patient and you think, oh, I have no idea what that is, excuse yourself, do a little hygiene check, swing by your office and look at it. It's organized in a beautiful manner that'll help you. So highly re recommend that. Thank you, Dr. Coltfarber. And then there are a few questions asking whether or not a link to the live recording will be sent out. Yes, we will be sending out a link of the live recording um, to registered participants over the coming week. So keep an eye on your inbox because you will be receiving that. Um, this next question comes from Dr. Patel, who wants to know if uh, you by any chance have an image of what a carotid artery calcification looks like on a CBT. I do. CBCT. Yes. And we were going to look at that, but I kind of ran out of time. Um, let's just pop one up real quick. Because uh, it's always more fun to look at, right? So if you don't mind hanging on for just a second, it takes a little bit to open this. So let's look at this. So um, I'm going to make it high contrast so we can see it. Now, the patient is swallowing. We do have some motion artifacts. You can see that right away. Um, but as we're going down through, we're going to see a couple of calcifications with this patient. Now, one thing I want to note, the patient's nose is up. This is the airway space. You can see our hyoid bone here. So we already know we're at the C3, C4 level. And just posterior and lateral to the airway space and posterior and lateral to the, airway, to the hyoid bone, we see this arcuate calcification. And so I'm going to zoom in on that in all three planes. Let's take a peek. Actually, we can see it bilaterally. So patient has bilateral calcified carotid atheromas. And of course, we know this does predispose the patient to an increased risk of stroke um, as well as heart attacks. So um, that um, research came out a bit ago. Um, but we can definitely... Uh, see that it looks more arcuate in those axial sections because it's rimming the artery, makes sense. Um, now it's right at the bifurcation of the common carotid. And so sometimes we can see it make kind of like a little V shape, it goes off, um, but it looks a little bit more like train tracks in those coronal sections. And it looks kind of like train tracks in our sagittal sections too. Um, now we did see some other calcifications. There's the one on the other side. Um, 
also some other classifications as well. So let's look in the airway space for that. We had some little tonsillus also up in the tonsillar tissues. But in any case, this is what we're looking for. It's at the C3, C4 level. We can use that hyoid bone to help us differentiate the soft tissues and kind of remind us what level we're at as well. It's gonna be posterior and lateral to the airway space and posterior and lateral to that hyoid bone. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Coltfarber. Um, we, some, Dr. Begdouri wanted to thank you for the webinar and was also asking if there are any measures for the airway space, normal versus abnormal. So that's a great question. Um, there was some research that was done that looked at some sort of correlation with possible obstructive sleep apnea. And I think in that research, it said a minimum cross-sectional area of 67 millimeter um, cubed or less, or millimeter squared or less. There we go. Hold on, let me pop one up. Anyway, um, but with that, we know that we're not really looking at the patient lying down. So that's what the research said. Now, a couple years ago, and I'll just I'll just pop one up because it's easier to sit and look at it and talk about it. Um, let's do this patient here because I don't think we looked at this one. Um, a couple years ago, we noticed that the software started changing it. And um, so much of the software will do automatic segmentation for you. And it gives you some amazing colors. And um, we started noticing that it would, it would turn red. Um, airway space, hold on, let's turn this guy down. It would turn red or, or dark or that sort of thing if it was less than really like 200 uh, millimeter square. So, Let's look at that. We'll go ahead and um, put this person's airway together. Now they've a little bit of overreach here. So we can always threshold with this particular software and look at it. Um, all right, so why, why did the software automatically change what we thought was a limited airway space? Great question. Uh, and I think that it was trying to kind of throw a wider net for what's out there. Um, and we looked at it, uh, so we still wanted to be more research-based and um, we rounded up our 67 millimeter squared to 100. So um, a little bit arbitrary, but we said 100 millimeter square or less is limited. It gets more in keeping with what the research showed. Um, and I, and we decided, okay, well, maybe hundred to 150 is probably on the small side of normal 200 really should, it's fairly normal. I mean, um, as far as the research says, and, um, you know, again, what is this doing? We have to go back to the intent of what this is. And again, we're looking at it, the CBCT, the patient is not supine. The patient is not asleep. Um, we know that we're getting the best view that we can of that patient in a standing or seated position. And so if we cast a little bit wider net, if your software at say 200 millimeters squared says, oh, it's, it's limited airway space, is that a bad thing? No, not necessarily. Um, you know, we try to be a little bit more um, conservative and follow with the research. So we say 100 millimeter squared or less um, is actually truly limited. But in any case, it opens up the conversation for you to have with Mrs. Jones, which is really what you're wanting in the first place. And you're wanting to show Mrs. Jones, this is what the airway space looks like here. We might need to send you on for sleep study if you answer yes to any of these questions. So uh, really what it does is it opens up that question to be able to ask her. Now, before we had automatic segmentations, we did this the manual way. And again, we looked for that minimum cross-sectional area but we also looked for our measurements in our um, AP and medial lateral dimension. And what we learned in that research is that the medial lateral dimension is the most important. Um, and if the medial lateral dimension was smaller than 14 millimeters in a male or smaller than 10 millimeters in a female, then we would call that limited. And when we looked at our AP dimension, if it was less than four millimeters, we would call that limited. Um, but again, these are just guidelines. We know that some people come in that, I mean, the airway space is ho so huge, you could drive a truck through it. And yet they've been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. 
and others, it seems like the airway space is small. When we're looking at it on our CBCT, could be because the tongue is posteriorly positioned or they could be in the process of swallowing. And so we don't have an accurate you know, measurement. Um, so sometimes it could look really small and yet the patient does not have obstructive sleep apnea. So we kind of always have to keep that in our heads. Um, this really opens up a great conversation for Mrs. Jones. If your software tags her as having a limited airway space when it looks larger um, than what the guidelines are, it's fine because then we ask more people more questions, cast that wider net, we can help more people out. So I hope that answered your question. I, I wish there was like, you know, specific guidelines that this correlates with this, but there really isn't because of the way that we're imaging these patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Colt Farber. And I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's. Um, so I will just wanted to let everybody know that we have captured everyone's questions and we will be emailing these questions to Dr. Colt Farber after the fact and get you a response via email. And we can we will uh, email the audience uh, the responses if that's okay with you, Dr. Colt Farber. Sure, you know, we have already done lectures in each of these areas as well. So always feel free to go back and watch those. Um, they uh, probably provide a lot more information. This was kind of a quick overview on how do you read the CDCT and what do you do with finding certain things as well. So you can deep dive into each of these different areas as well. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Colt Farber. This has certainly been an amazing presentation this evening. And I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. We did record tonight's webinar and we'll email the recording out sometime in the next week. And we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.